Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your favorite quarterback hater, Robert Mathis, and you're listening to the For the Culture Podcast. This is the For the Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears. The Colts double dip at the edge spot in the first round yesterday with Quiddy Pay, and today, 54th overall in the second round of the 2021 NFL Draft, the Indianapolis Colts select Deo Obengo, Edge Vanderbilt. This is the guy the Colts had high in their board. We were covering him back in March. We talked about him multiple times. You gave six names to keep an eye on for the Colts at the edge spots in the first and second round of this draft. We take two out of those six guys with our first two picks. So this is a guy the Colts were in on for quite a while. We were able to break this selection minutes before it was announced, which was pretty cool and a great job by you, Jason, being on top of it as we were able to confirm with multiple sources here on the For the Culture podcast that Deo Obengo was the pick for the Colts at 54. And it's a position you just can't have enough of. I know a lot of people wanted to tackle the Colts go with Obengo. There are, I guess you could say, some red flags with the torn Achilles, which is obviously the elephant in the room. But the Colts felt like the risk reward was worth it at 54. They make the selection back-to-back edge rushers for the Colts, adding depth to the defensive line with Deo Obango. Yeah, and if you guys have listened to the show or, or followed us on Twitter, you know that, you know, the five guys they really liked, he was in the top five, and he was actually three. Pay was one, he was three, Phillips was two. When Phillips was gone, obviously, it was the next guy on their board was, was Deo Obango. And so... A lot of people are losing their minds on Twitter, and I feel like I'm kind of here to talk people off the ledge a little bit. This player is an exceptionally talented player, and obviously, you know, we're going to go through his draft profile and break him down, but the first thing we need to talk about in the elephant in the room is the Achilles injury, and that's really, if you want to be completely honest, the main reason why this kid wasn't a late first, early second round pick. That's it. Now, the question I have for Chris Ballard is how confident are you that this kid is going to recover and be the, the player that he was pre-injury? That is that is the question because that is, to me, that determines what this kid's going to be. If he gets back to where he was at Vanderbilt, and you guys have to remember at Vanderbilt, he was surrounded by nothing on that defense. It was him and nothing else. So teams that played Vanderbilt, game plan for him every week and he still played extremely well did a good job so I didn't like the pick at first but the more that I think about it and the more that you know I kind of go over what I had written uh, written down about him the more I think this guy fits what we do because you can use him as a strong side edge rusher on the first two downs and slide him inside on the you know on the pass rushdown similar to quitty so but i do think in the end they're going to play those guys together i think this guy will be more of the edge setter and quitty will be more of the pass rusher but who knows maybe they'll be reversed but for now people need to chill we have enough edge rushers to get through the year i think this is a move for next year you remember we don't have a first round pick this guy was viewed as a you know, borderline first round pick, in my opinion, before the injury. And so you have to look at it that way. And next year, you know, you're probably going to lose Taekwon Lewis. You're probably going to lose Ture after, after this season because, you know, are we do we re-sign him? We're going to have a lot of free agents, all that stuff. I mean, a bunch of people coming up with deals that are that need to be get done, Naeem Hines. So a lot of those guys – you know, might not be around because those were all all the say all those guys were taken in that draft where we had a bunch of second round picks, correct? Yeah, that was 2018. We had all those second round picks, so they'll both so be all, up. They're going to all be up for free yep. agency next year, right? Yep, and you're obviously resigning Braden Smith. That's going to probably happen this off season. You're going to resign Darius Leonard, of course, to a mega deal, making him one of the highest paid linebackers in the league. We already gave the fifth year option to Quentin Nelson, and he'll get. Obviously, a mega contract, be the highest paid guard in the league. So that draft class is going to get paid. Naheem Hines is going to get paid, I believe, in Indianapolis because he's such a versatile piece and he's remained durable and healthy and a big part of this offense and special teams. He's a big part of this team. So I don't think right now that Ture will be back 
And I'm also leaning towards Taekwon Lewis not being back after the 2021 season. So these are guys. And then, of course, that question to Ballard, if we were able to be at the presser tonight or tomorrow and interview Ballard or question Ballard on this pick, the first thing you're going to ask him about is the health. And obviously, at 54, he felt confident enough in the player and the risk reward it's not like we took him at 25 we took him at 54 so you took him late enough where ballard obviously saw value and if you go back to march 30th when we got that message we were told that he was a top three option at edge for the colts pay was yep. number one he was number three he was in a tie for number three so we get two out of our top four and you could actually say two out of our top three, maybe even two out of our top two, because Phillips was peeled off the board earlier this week due to his medical red flags, which also right. could go back into this. Well, if people are nervous about the medical, obviously the Colts take that into consideration because they, well, they never passed on Phillips. But if Phillips were to have fallen in Miami, let's say they took a running back or something else, and both Phillips and Pay were there at 21. We're taking Pay over Phillips because of Phillips' medical. And this guy, obviously, makes it to 54, and we still take him. And you go back to last year, Ballard did the same thing with Julian Blackman. Now, ACL is a little bit different than an Achilles. An Achilles takes longer to recover from, and it's a more difficult recovery. But Ballard was not afraid of the torn ligament last year, and it worked out big time for the Colts does it again this year with Obango. So this is something that Ballard's done in the past and worked out. So it's not completely unchartered territory, especially because he's not going to need to come in and play right away. This is not our first round pick where you're going to rely on this guy to be a plug and play week one. It'd be nice if no. you could get him in the mix at some point this season, but he's not going to be a guy where if you don't have him week one or week two or week three, you have a huge void on your defensive line. This is a guy who they probably had a late first round grade on and they saw him at 54 and they just could not pass up the value and the risk reward came down to, is the injury worth this pick? And they said, yeah, because they probably had him graded about 20 spots higher. Yeah. And another way I'd look at it and just to simplify it is the Colts don't have a first round pick next year. And I look at this guy as basically he will play this year. A lot of people are like, Oh, he's not, he's going to, He's going to play, but he's going to be a more of a rotational guy, and it probably won't be until midseason at the earliest. They're going to take their time with this guy, but the way I look at it, they have no first-round pick, and if ever, if everything goes well for Carson, they probably and we make the playoffs, we don't have a first-round pick. So if we don't have a first-round pick, then I kind of look at this guy as a first-round pick because he's not really going to be playing that much. He's going to learn the defense, and so going into the season after that, He'll kind of be our first round pick. And so uh, he'll have that extra time to get ready next year. He'll learn the defense. He won't be counted on as much. And I think you're like, I think you're right. I think you're going to see Lewis leave. I think Trey's possible. Banigou, who knows? I mean, they might even trade one of these guys. You never know. But the bottom line is that you can't, this, this kid is talented. He has things that you can't teach. And so I look at it like that. I, it's not, a, I don't, I, I try to get people when they think about moves to think outside the the micro and think more macro, long term, big picture. And while I understand the biggest issue being the Achilles injury, I get that. I get it. But at the same time, I don't think Chris Ballard makes this move unless he is a hundred percent confident this kid is going to make a full recovery. So you guys, I understand the frustration of the left tackle and all that stuff. And there were guys that I liked but just not at that pick. Mm. And the Colts had this guy on their board. He was at the top of their board, clearly. And, and I've known that they've liked him since March. And Jason, so, also, when you go to our mock, we trade back, so that's a little bit different. We trade back. Pay was off the board in our mock. So we trade back and we take Tryon in the first round. In the second round, what do we take? We take a defensive tackle. This guy has the position flexibility, the versatility on the defensive line. I saw a lot of people saying that on Twitter he's more of a defensive tackle. Well, in our mock, we went defensive end, defensive tackle. Ballard kind of goes with two hybrid guys in the first and second round, guys that could play inside-outside. Let's go back to free agency. When we were missing on all the available 
pass rushers of free agency, what did we report? That there was a chance that we would see more snaps at defensive end this year from DeForest Buckner. Now we draft two guys that have the ability to play inside, adding depth. Last year when Buckner and Autry missed that Titans game, we got gashed up the middle. We needed defensive tackle depth. That was a big need. I see a lot of people talking about cornerback and other needs. Defensively, the biggest need after defensive end was probably defensive tackle depth and then I would say safety depth and then I would say corner probably last after bringing back both Rhodes and Carey and getting Marvell Tell back off the COVID list from last year after opting out so this kind of fills multiple needs with his ability to play multiple positions along the defensive line so you go back to last year Buckner Autry both missed that Titans game Autry now leaves goes to the Titans we needed depth there in the middle of the defensive line. I think we addressed that a little bit with both of these first two picks with Pay and now with Obango. And then you have the ability now to move Buckner around as well, which is something we talked about back in March during free agency when we were missing on the big ticket pass rushing free agents. Right. And, and listen, you know, the thing with this is, People, I saw, and you're right. I saw a lot of people mention corners. Listen, I love corners, but if your if your pass rush is trash, I don't care if you've got Deion Sanders out there or, you know, uh, Mike Haynes or somebody, you know, some of these Rod Woods. It's, I mean, those are the greatest that ever played the game, and they can't cover for eight seconds. So, you, you, I mean, he attacked the week. This is what I wanted him to do. I wanted him to attack the week. He's he's done it. He's done it. And now we're younger, you know, Houston's gone. Autry, who I wanted them to keep, is gone. So now we're extremely young there. Now there's a chance we maybe go out and sign one more free agent to kind of get, to get us through this year. Maybe you get Olivier Vernon, another Achilles guy, or maybe you go out and get Kerrigan. I don't know now whether that'll happen because I think they're probably going to – look more to the left tackle because I just don't think now that I think most of the really talented guys are gone. So I'm, I'm sure they'll probably maybe take a developmental guy, but that's not going to be a guy that starts day one next year. So I I'm looking at maybe Fisher, like I said, Fisher Schwartz, the guy from uh, Pittsburgh as a stopgap guy, just to get us to the next season. And then you can pick a left tackle. So listen, this guy can play. Let me get into this breakdown loop. This guy can play. All right. So that's the first thing I want to put to bed. When he's on the field, this guy's a very good football player, and that's what we want to add to this team. And a very good teammate, a very high-character player. He was a three-year starter at Vandy. He has good size, length, strength, and athleticism. So he's got everything. He's got a strong lower body that allows him to anchor and set the edge, which we always want to do in our run game because, you know, that's what we do. We set edges and and – you know, allow our linebackers to make plays. As Luke talked about, this guy can slide inside on passing downs, and he makes a big difference in there. I really think they're going to use this guy as a defensive end on the first two downs, and on passing downs, slide him inside with Buckner or maybe, you know, whatever they decide to do. I think he's going to rush the passer from the defensive tackle position, and I think he's, you know, I think he's going to be good. He's very athletic. He's very strong. He's very big. He uses his length well. He knocks a lot of balls down, gets in the quarterback's uh, uh, sight line so he can't see where he's throwing the ball. So he's, you know, he's, he's very active. He's, he's very, there's a lot of activity with this player. Really, really plays hard. Great hands, has solid pass rushing repertoire, but definitely he need, needs to improve it. I think this is an issue with a lot of these guys coming to the league. They're, they've, they're so used to beating guys on speed and beating guys on bull rush and all that stuff that they don't ever really develop too much of a pass rush repertoire. He's got more than most though. He's got more in the tank than most or more in the toolbox than most, but definitely some development there is needed. He's a good counter rusher with a strong change of direction. He's able to change direction quickly, which is pretty impressive to watch when you're talking about a guy, his size and he's very active with a nonstop motor, which again, th these are the guys you love. You love defensive players that just play their ass off all the time. This guy will run plays down. He's big, but he's fast. And he will run plays down on the backside. When teams try to run that, that stretch play, 
and you all and, and they don't block the backside. And this and that's happened to us plenty of times, Luke, where we've given the ball to, to Mac or somebody and, and you've seen the backside end run it down. He's that type of player to run the play. And, and so is Pay. Both of those guys will run that backside play down. And that's those are huge plays. And that's what they did in college. That's why they had so many tackles for loss. This guy had a ton of tackles for loss in college, just like Pay did. Because they play hard, they chase plays down. So a lot of, of really positive traits with this guy. I mean, the, the the way he flies around, he's always around the ball, and he's relentless, relentless in his backside pursuit. Never gives up on plays, and he will chase, you know, he chases plays down. So while I do think they're, you know, the Achilles is the elephant, okay? The, the elephant in the room, we all know it. We got to see what he does after that. But, like, we got to trust Ballard, man. I, like I, I've I've missed on so many players because I I didn't trust Ballard until like until he proves to me that he doesn't know what he's doing, which hopefully never happens. I'm gonna trust him, and I, I believe this guy is gonna turn into something positive for the Colts, mainly because of the way that he's built and the way that he plays and the way the the intensity that he plays with. And I think Pay is exactly the same way. So we got two guys that I think are gonna be a big part of our future. And I don't think edge is going to be an issue for a while. And we certainly know the two defensive tackles aren't going to be an issue. So we've got, I think you'll see next, you know, in the next couple of years, we're going to have this consistent starting four and I, it's, it's going to be fun to watch. And then you're going to have guys that are rotational guys that you mix and match around it. And it just gives flu so many more options. I mean, you still got Banigou who will be around after, after the year, after next year, and you've got uh, Ture and, and Lewis next year that will probably be free agents. So you've got options. This this gives you options. So I wanted him to attack the edge, and he's done it. And, he you know, he's got guys that are versatile, scheme versatile, very good at what they do. And, um, you know, I didn't like it at first, but the more I thought about it I'm, and, and the more I looked at what my notes on this guy – I mean, he can make a difference for the Colts. And I certainly think, you know, obviously probably not much of one next year, but I think having that time in the classroom and, and learning under Flus and learning under Brian Baker and being around, the, you know, his teammates and whatnot is going to be huge for the camaraderie of the room and also for him to learn the defense. So when he comes in the next year, uh, he's going to make an, an immediate impact. So I'm not down on this move as much as a lot of people are because I didn't see a lot of options there that were difference makers as far as I was concerned. So I don't really have a problem with the pick on second thought. So I think the Colts have done well the first two rounds. I know a lot of people don't like the move because of the Achilles thing, but you just got to trust that Ballard has all the medical stuff and he knows all the medical stuff and he believes in the player and he believes he's going to be back to 100%. And I choose to believe the same thing because I don't think this guy would risk his job and, you know, go out and sign a guy this early or t- take a guy this early without having complete and 100% belief that he's going to be healthy. So, you know, Luke, you asked me about my grade last night. I gave the pay grade A plus. Obviously, this is not going to be an A plus, but I give it a B. I give it a B and it's all contingent on the on the health. And I w- really I kind of wanted to wait and do this whole draft thing before. And so after I heard what Ballard had to say, so I could be a little bit more specific about the injuries, because I know that's going to be the question that he gets a lot of, and I'm sure he's going to break that down. And by the time this is out, you know, he'll probably have already spoke to the media, but bottom line is you go with, you go with your board and he was the highest guy on the board. Now we don't have to worry about edge. It's taken care of Uh, you. Maybe you sign a vet. Maybe you don't, maybe you let the young guys sink or swim. I mean, I don't know, but, I do know they'll figure this left tackle thing out. I'm not, I'm not too, I'm not tripping about it. Like there, there wasn't anybody worth risking it there for, and so I'm good, man. I'm, I'm good with this pick. <laughs> I'm sure Flus is is probably really, really good with this pick and the and the first pick. So I'm excited for our defense because I always said if we ever get pass rushers, this thing is going to be something special. Now we've got, we've got two. One probably won't make a big impact this year, but I think the other one will. And so I'm really excited, man. It's an exciting time to be a Colts fan, and I'm excited to see what they can do once they get on the field. Without a doubt. And also, we just talked about going, obviously, back-to-back defensive linemen. We don't take a tackle. Tackle coming into the draft, in my opinion, was the biggest need on the offensive side of the ball. 
Second biggest need on the roster. Arguably the biggest need on the roster, depending on how you want to look at it. I would still have said edge one, tackle two. But you could have really went back and forth. I think valid points could have been made on both sides. And it's a deep right. tackle draft. We obviously don't go tackle with the first two picks. We don't have a third round pick unless we trade up in the next couple of minutes and get into the third round or trade up earlier into the fourth round. But at this point in time, our next pick is until our pick in the fourth round, yeah. which is in the 120s, right? 127, 124? It's either 124 or 127. I, I can't remember. So that's pretty deep, right? You go from 54 all the way to 120-something. So you're going over 65, 70 picks without a selection chances are you're not going to get a franchise left tackle in the fourth round you might take a tackle i don't know if there'll be a franchise tackle that late in the draft so what do you do maybe you go with a veteran free agent following the draft because i didn't like any of the guys they signed before the draft as far as tackles like tevy and all those guys so let's say they do that stop gap it worked in the playoffs yeah la raven clark sucked and Chaz green sucked but then when we brought in, what was his name? I'm blanking now because it's so late. Vander. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, guy. yeah. And then he went back Valdir. to the Packers. Well, yeah, Jared Valdir. Yeah, and he played really well for the Colts in the playoffs, yeah. down the stretch of the season, yeah. into the playoffs. I think Taylor had that 250-yard rushing game with him at left yeah. tackle. He did. He did, he right? Did. So yes, sir. let's say you go with a veteran tackle. Now we go into next year's draft. With or without pay it's going to be a need next year edge rusher right it's going to be a need and you have the contract expiring for Ture and lewis we don't know what they're going to do at those spots yet those guys obviously have to prove something and show something we saw lewis take a step last year we're going to need to see the same from Ture now coming off the injury and now having another surgery as ballard said this off season he'll finally be 100 percent healthy for the first time since, since Kansas that great City. start in 2019 yeah. that sack against Patrick Mahomes, really nailing down that win, unfortunately destroying his ankle, goes two-plus years without being fully 100% healthy. So to get him back this year, we'll see if he could earn himself another contract, even earn a prove-it contract in Indianapolis. But my point being, going into next year, with the question marks with those two guys having to earn themselves contracts, with Houston gone, with Autry gone, Muhammad coming back, but he's more of a rotational guy. You're not going to build around and al Muhammad. So it was a huge need beyond just pay in the first round. Going into next year's draft, if we were to sign, let's say, a veteran stopgap left tackle next week to go into this season, then next year we don't have a first-round pick when you look at the Wentz trade. And then in the second round, you're going to have to take the best tackle available which means we wouldn't be picking again until the third round where you could start thinking about taking a defensive end. So that would have been the third round of next year. This year in the second round, we get a guy the Colts probably had a late first round grade on. And even if he were to miss this entire year with an injury, he would be ready by the time next year's guy would be ready for the 2022 season. And that's when Lewis and Ture might be gone. So when you think about the timeline like that, This all adds up, makes a lot of sense. I would give it a B right now in the moment. But if all those things play out the way we're kind of, you know, hypothetically speaking, moving forward, it could go from a B to an A. And then, of course, with performance, if this guy turns into a starter down the road for eight plus years or whatever, it could turn into a great pick. So I'm happy. I'm satisfied so far. I'm not thrilled about the tackle position but i do believe there are veterans out there to be signed and we'll see what they do tomorrow in the fourth round yeah i mean listen you you can't i mean it's 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 such a delicate balance between you know reaching okay we have to get this we have to get a left tackle is this guy and, and you look at a guy and you're like is this guy the guy and you just look at your board and and it's just not the guy you just like it's like Chris Ballard says, it, it, when you start reaching, that's when people start losing their jobs. You have to stay true to your board. This guy was clearly at the top of their board. They were com- completely convicted in taking this guy. I, and I'm going to ride with that. This We're talking about the best GM when it comes to the draft in the league, bar none, in my opinion. Especially in the second round. 
it, his it, bread it, and butter it, round is the second round. And the crazy thing, Jason, the picks people hate on the most go back to 2018. Darius Leonard crucified yeah. for that pick. Arguably his best pick to date. Last year, us, the Jonathan Taylor pick, we were not thrilled yeah. with that pick in the yeah. moment. Happy to admit we were wrong. And Jonathan Taylor last year was an Offensive Rookie of the Year candidate. And this year, he'll be fighting with Derrick Henry for the rushing title, in my opinion. Right. So right. Ballard's killed the second round, especially the picks he's taken the most criticism for. So, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's, it's, I mean, he's, they, he, they have to do right by their board. Yep. You don't, st- you don't wait, you don't work your ass off all that time to stack a board and then not take, like, you know, not follow it. You know what I mean? Yep. So, so I, I think Colt fans need, need to put their faith and, and trust in this guy because he's proven himself to be an elite evaluator. Yes, it sucks. The kids coming off the Achilles injury but at the same time that heals he gets you know kind of a red shirt year while Ture and, and Banigou and and Lewis kind of you know you find out what you have with those guys which in my honest opinion is not a whole lot but we'll see um I do I think Ture and I mean I I don't even know what to make of Banigou. well you know I uh, think I think the reason a lot of Cole fans are upset with this pick isn't even the player per se. In right. Odeng, I think it's more so not taking a tackle, which I totally understand and sympathize with. And I, again, I think I could have, you can't reach. I know you, you can't, can't reach. Well, you can't reach. And also beyond not reaching, because let's say fans out there had higher grades on tackles that were still on the board. And to them, it wouldn't have been a reach. When you look at the tackle position from last year to this year, and we were extremely critical with Anthony Costanzo on the roster last year, we were extremely critical of the depth of the tackle position going into the season. But one of the big reasons why was because of the 39-year-old immobile quarterback. I don't want to say that tackle's not important with Carson Wentz. It obviously is extremely important. Especially when he's fumbled a lot. Yeah, Yeah, and he's fumbled a lot, and he's injury prone, and he's had injuries, and he's missed playoff games. So, of course, it's important. But with the ability to roll him around and move him around in the pocket, there's other ways to help protect him. Yeah. With Phillip Rivers, it's like you have to build a wall because – he could get the ball off quick, which saved him multiple times. But he was a statue there in terms of mobility in the pocket. Like he wasn't going to be flushed out of the pocket and throw from the hash, you know, outside the numbers. So when you look at the tackle position from that standpoint, it takes the pressure off Reich because Reich could do certain things moving that the he pocket yeah. exactly yeah. that he couldn't do last year. So it adds flexibility, mobility, and another unique look to the offense. Not to say it's not important. It's extremely important, and I don't think we're done, despite what we do the rest of this draft, at the tackle position in free agency. I think we're going to add to that position without a doubt, but that's just to make everybody sleep a little bit more sound tonight. I don't think it's quite as important as it was last year because Phillip Rivers was a 39-year-old statue in the pocket so just a little food for thought yeah and also i think one thing people are gonna i think notice about Wentz this next year that wasn't the case the last two or three in philly will will be the quickness that he gets the ball out like the biggest issue with Wentz in philadelphia was lack of, his offensive line wasn't very good no you're breaking up the- you're breaking up let's just wrap it up though okay just wrap it up. Yeah, so we'll just, we'll just wrap it up. We'll be back again, of course, tomorrow with the fourth round. As we now proceed, we have four picks tomorrow, and that'll wrap it up, right? Four, five, six, seven, and that'll be it for the Colts draft. So if we trade back tomorrow, maybe we recoup picks, get a couple more picks. But right now at the moment, we have four picks coming in tomorrow. We obviously made the two picks yesterday and today with Quiddy Pay today with Deo Obango out of Vanderbilt as we add depth to the defensive line and you could never have enough pass rushers. This isn't like we went back-to-back running back or back-to-back tight end. The defensive end position is a position you really can't have enough of. 
if the quarterback and protecting the quarterback is the most important thing, then getting after the other team's quarterback and hitting the other team's quarterback and getting him off his mark and sacking him is the next most important thing, making them uncomfortable. Obviously, a huge need for this team as Ballard double dips at the defensive end position in the second round of the 2021 NFL Draft. That's my man, Jason Spears. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, and we will be back tomorrow with the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh rounds. We'll probably spread that out over two days, Saturday and Sunday, and then we'll get into the undrafted guys the day after that, which should be a ton of fun right here on the Fourth Culture Podcast.